get really used to having really nice, clear examples of supply and demand curves. People draw for us. They give us the equations, and we just seem to assume that these things are lying around, and economists just need to go and pick it up off the ground, and ooh, there we have a demand curve. There we have a supply curve. As you move from introductory level micro to intermediate level micro, you need to start to have an appreciation how difficult it is to figure out exactly what a demand or a supply curve looks like. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that we're looking at, say, the price of gasoline. What do we see when we look out at gasoline markets today? Well, let's just assume that today we collect the data and recently the price of gasoline, let's just suppose it was about $3.50 and the quantity of gasoline sold is say about 10 gallons per week for the average family of four or something like that. So whenever we go out and we look at a market, we see the equilibrium price, we see the equilibrium quantity, and if we put that on a graph, of course, here is what that's gonna look like. It's a point. It's not a demand curve, it's not a supply curve. And so how is it that we can try to figure out what a demand curve looks like, what a supply curve looks like. Well, one way is, since we know that a demand curve tells us all the various quantities demanded that people would want to buy on a certain day at a variety of prices, we could go out and survey a lot of demanders and carefully, to make sure that they're not just making up numbers, carefully ask them questions about, well, Okay, today the price is $3.50, but what if the price was $6? How much would you want to buy? And if we very carefully did surveys like this and we got accurate answers, then we could maybe get the answer that, oh, well, if, if the price of gas was $6 a gallon, then maybe I would only want to buy maybe eight gallons of gas. And if the price of gasoline was 10, then maybe I would want to buy seven gallons of gas or something like that. And then by connecting these points together, we could get something that would approximately represent the demand curve for gasoline for those people that we interviewed. Similarly, we could go out and survey many, many people who are suppliers of the product. And we could say, okay, well, you know, this is, this is what's happening today. The price is 350 and you're supplying 10 gallons per family of four, then what would you do if the price were to increase to $6 per gallon? And they might say, well, I, I would then be willing and able to supply 11 gallons worth of gas per family of four. And if the price went up to $10 per gallon, I would be willing to supply 13 gallons per family of four. And then if we connected all those dots together, we could get something that is gonna be an estimate of what a supply curve looks like in the market. That would be a lot of work and it is extremely difficult to get accurate answers when you survey people like this. It's a lot easier, a lot better to actually view, to witness, to watch people and see what they do when prices change. So what we normally do is over a certain period of time, we hope that demand shifts and supply shifts for various reasons. And then we'll try to use that information to try to figure out what demand and supply curves look like in a given time period. So suppose this blue dot is what's happening today, but then we witness something like this point in three or four weeks from now. Question, what must have happened? And what kind of curve can we identify from that thing happening? Well, if you just use your eyes, you can say, well, if I were to connect these dots together, then that looks like it would give us something like a supply curve because it's an upward sloping curve. And so whenever we see two points kind of like this, if we assume that only one thing has changed, just supply or just demand, then we can identify a supply curve. However, what must have shifted, what must have changed in order for us to identify that supply curve? Demand must have changed, right? Now, we are not gonna know anything really about what the demand curve looks like, but we will be able to assume that the demand curve must have shifted. 
in order to get people to be willing and able to buy more at a higher price, demand must have increased. So I'll draw these in light gray. We don't really know what these two demand curves are going to look like, but we know that demand went up. So whenever we're trying to estimate, trying to figure out what a given supply curve looks like, we look for periods of time when we see points kind of like this, and when we're reasonably confident that the supply is not also shifting. Now for another example, how would we identify what a demand curve looks like? Well, we would look for a period in time where we get another point that looks something like this. And if we can assume that nothing has changed about demanders, there is something going on with the suppliers though, then we can assume that these two points might lie on the same demand curve. And what must have changed? Supply. And so if we're in a period of time, like in this case, again, we're not going to really know what these supply curves look like, but we can reasonably assume that supply decreased between those two points. And what we're witnessing is just a change in quantity demanded, allowing us to witness what a demand curve looks like. All right, let me give you one more example here, and then we'll look at some real data. What would we assume if we saw a point like this one? What's changing? Is it going to be demand or is it going to be supply? Well, it has to be both, right? It has to be both. Well, how do we know that? Well, again, we're not going to really know what the demand curves or the supply curves look like, so I'll kind of put question marks there. But the only way to get from point A here to point B is it can't just be supply changing, it can't just be demand changing, it must be both. So this supply curve must be decreasing to give us a new supply curve. Again, we're not going to know exactly what that supply curve looks like, but we have to be able to infer that supply decreased. Similarly, the only way to get from these two points from A to B is demand also has to be decreasing. So there must be another demand curve. So the only way to get the same price at different quantities, supply and demand have to both have decreased. Similarly, if we had a point like C over here, supply and demand must both be increasing. You need to sit down and work out what must be happening to get us to a point like D from A to D, and then what could be happening to get us from a point like A to a point like E. Make sure you could explain that. Now, as I've mentioned previously, most of the time, 99% of the time, in any kind of test question, multiple choice kinds of question in an economics class, we're going to be assuming that only one of the curves is changing. It's either demand or supply. But in cases like this, if you're moving at the different quantity at the same price, both have to be changing. Or a different price at the same quantity, both have to be changing. And you need to be able to work out what is changing in what direction. Now, of course, there are edge cases. There are strange things that can happen sometimes, little exceptions. For example, what if you had a demand curve that was straight up and down at a fixed quantity? Well, then you could have the same quantity at different prices. So that brings us to this handout with some real world data on supply and demand of gasoline. Well, it's really just equilibria. So this is data going back to 1955 in the United States. And what we have here on the x-axis is the total quantity of gasoline per capita in the United States. So how many gallons of gasoline per capita in the United States were consumed? So this is controlling for the population. So we take the total number of gasoline gallons sold each year, divide it by the population to get the per capita amount. And then on the y-axis, this is the price in dollars per gallon, and this is in $2,005. So we're adjusting for inflation here. We're controlling for inflation, just trying to see what else is going on. So of course we have price up on the y-axis, we have quantity 
on the x-axis. So since right now we're in the 2020s, you might wonder, well, how do I convert from prices in 2005 to prices that are a little more like today? We'll talk about that in just a bit. But let's just look at all these equilibrium points and try to see what might we be able to infer without going into too much detail. Well, first, let's look at these blue points here. Now, these blue points on the left are what was happening from 1955 to 1969. And pretty much what seems to be happening year after year is the price was staying roughly constant, but the quantity kept increasing and increasing and increasing. So what has to be going on as we go through time? And I'll just tell you, even though I don't have these uh, points all labeled, that these points in the far left are 1955, 6, 7, and 8. And as we move through 1969, we get to this blue point on the right. So what must have been happening, even though we don't know exactly what these demand and supply curves looked like each year, we can picture that it must have been demand and supply increasing year after year after year. And we're just seeing different equilibria as demand and supply of gasoline both increase. During this period of time, incomes in the United States were increasing, more people were buying cars, and that explains the demand increasing. I'm not 100% sure what was going on with supply, but it's pretty obvious that supply was keeping up with increases in, in demand. They were both increasing at about the same rate each year. As we get into the 1970s, we have these purple points. They're all over the place. So we have some of them that are keeping around the same price, but then we have a couple. We have 1979, where the price really skyrockets. We have 1973, where the price was really low. I'm not sure there's a whole lot we can figure out from the 1970s without a lot of additional information. Let's look at the 2010s, though. In the 2010s, we see a lot of orange points here, and if we were to draw a line through them, that could be a pretty steep demand curve. We'd probably need some more information. Are demand curves for gasoline really steep or are they really flat? And all of the studies that have been done on gasoline, particularly in the United States, but this is true in most other countries as well, is that indeed the demand curve for gasoline is very steep. As the price of gasoline goes up, what people do for the most part is complain, but they don't really use a lot less gasoline. So what we would be looking for to kind of validate that idea in the 2010s is if that's one demand curve in the 2010s, is it true that for the most part, people's incomes, tastes and preferences, and all those things that we want to hold constant when we look at one demand curve, are those things pretty steady throughout the 2010s, but what must be happening to allow us to identify that demand curve is are there a lot of things that are shifting supply up and down of oil and or gasoline and indeed that is what was happening through the 2010s for the most part so let's add three more recent points to this graph we have 2018 and 2019 here in the center well let's add 2020 2021 and 2022 using these numbers over here on the right. So in 2020, in 2015 dollars, the price was $1.94 and the quantity was 377 gallons roughly. So right around here would be the quantity between 350 and 400 and a price around two. So can we figure out anything that might have been responsible for what happened going from 2018 to 2019 to 2020? Well, it's just a guess. Without more information, we can't be sure, but if I draw a line through those points, it kind of looks like that could be a supply curve. We can't be sure that it is a supply curve, really, without more detail, but it could be a supply curve. And if it is a supply curve, then what must have been changing? Well, if that's 2019, their demand curve might look something like that, then what has to have happened to demand in 2020? Must have been a decrease in demand, right? 
So, who can help me? What happened in 2020 that might have reduced the demand for gasoline in the United States? COVID, right? And so, what is the big category we might want to put that in? I would probably just put it in tastes and preferences. For some reason, something made people need to buy less gasoline, drive less. And with COVID, a lot of students weren't going to school, so school buses weren't running. And a lot of people weren't going to work, they were working from home. And so we see a really severe decrease in demand. And again, that could, this green could represent a supply curve, but let me draw these in gray because we, we really don't know what these other demand curves would look like, except we can be pretty sure that they are steep, right? Historically speaking, gasoline demand is very price inelastic. As the price goes up, people really don't buy a lot less. Now let's see what happened in 2021. Next point, so the quantity was about 412, the price $2.62. So what could have happened to get us from this point in 2020 to this point in 2021? Well, we can't be 100% sure, but if, suppose for some reason we were sure that 2018, 2019, and 2020 were all on the same supply curve, then to get to this point, again, assuming that demand curves are pretty steep like this, what must have happened between 2020 and 2021? Well, demand had to have increased. So again, let's draw these demand curves pretty steep, similar to the orange points. And, you know, it's also fairly reasonable to assume that these gray points in the early 2000s also might represent something like a demand curve. So if all of our demand curves are similarly steep, and again, that's a big assumption, I'm not saying we know that's true, then between 20 and 2021, demand increased. So people went back to school, people went back to their jobs, and we used more gasoline. But also, it appears that maybe something happened to decrease the supply. If it's true, that these supply curves are pretty flat while the demand curves are pretty steep, then to get to that point from 2020 to 21, supply and demand shifted. Now, it's easy to imagine why demand increased, but why did supply decrease? Doing a little reading, it seems like OPEC may have cut their production. So that might be what's accounting for this supply decrease, since OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, still controls a decent sized chunk of the international oil market. So with demand increasing and because of the low prices of oil and the low demand in 2020, OPEC cutting the supply, that could explain the combination of those two things, how we ended up in 2021. Again, this is something that people who specialize in energy economics, it's their job to try to figure out these things what's been happening in the recent past, and what do I see going forward to try to help companies try to guess what's going to be happening in oil markets in the future so that they can try to anticipate those and make adjustments. Okay, so finally, 2022, this data is that I'm using here in 2022 is not quite complete. It takes a while for all the data to come in, but for results for most of the year in 2022, we have uh, just about exactly the same quantity as in 2021. So not enough difference to be able to even visualize on this graph, 412 to 409, but the price went sky high. So we're talking about way, way, way up in here. So we have to be able to understand what happened. Two things must have happened here. Well, if we draw our little gray stand-in demands and supplies, we know that to get between those two points, supply must have decreased to get to another supply curve that goes through that point, and demand must have increased to get us to a line that goes through that point in 2022. So why would demand increase? 
Well, the economies of most nations in the world have really been going very, very strong. In fact, so strong that it's causing inflation. And so as these economies have come out of COVID and just about everybody's gone back to school and everybody's gone back to work and people's incomes were increasing, that's gonna increase the demand for oil. Supply decreased largely because of the war in Ukraine and a lot of sanctions being put on Russia. So I'm a microeconomist and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time thinking about CPI and inflation, but as microeconomists, sometimes we do need to be able to use consumer price indexes to control for inflation so that we can compare real price numbers to each other. So just to give you an idea about how you would convert prices between $2,005 that we see in this graph to 2022 prices, multiply by about 0.66. So in other words, if you had a price in 2022, suppose you drove by the gas station and you saw that the price of gas in your neighborhood was $3.19, how would that fit on this graph in terms of prices. Well, you multiply it by about 0.66, and we'll see where that number comes from in a second. $3.19 times 0.66 gives us about $2.10. So 2005 dollars are worth more than a dollar is today. So that equivalent price, removing the effect of inflation, would be comparable to $2.10 back in 2005. So if we look at, say, the actual price of gasoline in 2005, in 2005 dollars, it looks like it was about, say, $2.30. So the actual price of gas in 2005 was really, when you think about real prices taking out the effect of inflation, really a little bit less today than it was back in 2005. Now, how do we get this multiplier 0.66? So if we look up the CPI, now there are a lot of different tables of consumer price indexes using different base years. And the base year is just the year that you're gonna call the consumer price index 100. So in this graph, I used a consumer price index table that was 2005 was the base year. Most commonly, whenever you look up CPI tables though, the base year is 1982 to 1984. Instead of just using one year, since prices were very volatile in the early 1980s, they use a range of years. So 1982 to 84 is the base year. That's when 100 is. Today's CPI, at least at the end of 2022, the CPI was about 296.8. If we compare that to the average consumer price index back in 2005, again, using 82 to 84 is the base year, that one was 195.3. So that means that prices in 2005 were about 95% higher than they were back in 1982 to 84, and prices at the end of 2022 were about triple what prices were back in 1982 to 1984. Just for reference, whenever I had jobs back in 1982 to 84, I was making $3.35 per hour. So if you were to triple that roughly to today, then you'd have about $10 an hour. Comparatively speaking, I was earning $10 per hour in today's dollars way back then in the early 80s. So that number 0.66 is what you get if you take the consumer price index from 2005, and then you divide it by the consumer price index today. That's how you can convert prices today back into $2,005. So you get about 0.66. Now, if you wanted to take a price, say you had a price in a catalog from back in 2005, and you wanted to inflate that price up to, what would that be in today's dollars? then you can calculate the reciprocal. And that will give you a little multiplier to tell you what you would do to the price. So 296.8 divided by 195.3 will give you about 1.52. So just as an example, back in 2005, I had a friend who was living in a cheap apartment 
And let's suppose that that cheap apartment was about 750 a month. So about how much would that apartment cost be in today's dollars for comparison? Multiply that by 1.52 and you get about $1,140 in today's money or at least end of 2022 dollars. All right, let's look at one more example of how you can use real world data to talk about deriving supply and demand equations. This is data from the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s in the United States looking at the milk market. Now, why the milk market? Well, this data allows us to look at supply and demand in a very different way. The milk price in the United States is regulated by the federal government. Now these days in the United States, and this has been going on for about the last five or 10 years, the price that the government sets is pretty close to the equilibrium price. But back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in the United States, that was not true. Now let's just look at our standard graph of what it looks like when you have a price floor on the price of a good. We have demand, we have supply, we have equilibrium. Now let's just assume that this equilibrium price in this little graph I'm drawing here is $3, say per gallon of milk, and the equilibrium quantity is say 100. Then if we put in a price floor, that's a legal minimum price, and if that price floor is above the equilibrium price, say at $4, then the, we know the quantity supplied, the quantity that farmers would want to sell is gonna increase because the price is higher. And we know that the quantity people wanna buy from the store is gonna be less, so the quantity demanded decreases. Supply is not changing and demand is not changing. So we might end up with 140 supplied and only say 60 demanded. That means that we're going to have a surplus of the difference. 140 minus 60 would be an 80, say, million gallon surplus. Now, the only way for a government to keep a policy in effect like this, to have an effective price floor, is that the government has to buy the surplus. So the bigger the difference between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded, the more the government has to come in and buy that surplus and then do something with it. In the United States, when the government bought this milk, we all know that milk is gonna spoil quickly if you don't do something with it. So what the United States government did is two things. They turned this milk into cheese, and this is the origin of the famous government cheese that we've all heard about. Although these days it seems more like a myth than reality because we don't have a lot of government cheese anymore in the United States. And that's because they set this price floor nearly identical to the equilibrium price. So there's not a lot of surplus they need to buy. There's not a lot of government cheese. The other thing that the federal government did with this surplus of milk is they would convert it into dry milk powder and they would send this dry milk powder to countries that are having famines or natural disasters to try to give them something nutritious that's easy to ship and easy to store. So the data that I used to draw these points, we knew several things. Number one, I knew each year in the data what was the price that the United States government set for the official price of milk. Second, I knew the quantity of milk produced in the United States. And again, on the x-axis, this is roughly per person in the United States. So gallons per person per year. And it looks like the equilibrium here, if we look at the equilibrium of kind of the, the trend line of all of these orange points, if, if we called that a supply curve, and then for these, we called that a demand curve for all these blue points, the equilibrium would look like about 72 gallons per person per year. So that's a little bit more than a gallon per week per person in the United States. And that might make sense, especially since we're not just talking about milk to drink. We're also talking about the milk used to make cheese and pastas and frozen dinners and, and all kinds of things out there in the United States. So a little more than a gallon per person per year on average. But what we see is that in most of these years, 
let's just focus on this yellow highlighted year right here. In that year, the price target, the, the price floor in the United States was set at $3.30 per gallon. The amount actually produced by farmers in that year was about 75 gallons per person in the United States. The quantity actually purchased per person in the United States was closer to about 68 gallons per person. That means that in that year, the federal government of the United States had to go out and buy seven gallons per person for every person in the United States. So that's seven times roughly, say, 250 or 300 million people, depending on how many people there were in that given year. We'll say 250 million people. So seven gallons times 250 million, that's 1,750,000,000 gallons of milk that the government had to purchase and convert into government cheese or dry milk powder or something. That is a ridiculous waste of money. Why did the government do this? And what impact does it have? Well, the main reason for doing it is you get all the dairy farmers together they hire lobbyists, they go to Washington, D.C., and they try to convince all the senators and all the Congress people, hey, our family dairy farms, we're in trouble, and we need the government's help to keep us from going bankrupt, and we need you to support the price of milk. Well, everybody wants to support dairy farmers and, and support the price of milk. That sounds like a good thing. But when you support the price of milk, that means that you are raising the price of milk above the equilibrium price. You are forcing people in your country to pay more per gallon of milk. You are forcing them to pay more taxes because of all these millions of gallons of milk and surplus that the government has to buy. And then they have to figure out something to do with all that extra milk. So it costs the taxpayer, it costs ordinary consumers, and it puts extra money in the pockets of the dairy farms. So this is another way that you could collect some data in a specific market where you know that there are price floors. If you can get data on how much is produced, what the price level is for that price floor, and then they recorded data on how much of this surplus they bought each year, that gives us the quantity demanded, right? Quantity supplied is how much is produced. Quantity demanded is produced minus the amount that the government has to buy. So I hope that looking at some of this real world data on real world examples of how is it that economists can actually look at data and all we can really see are equilibrium points and how is it that we can try to construct an idea of what demand and supply curves might look like and how we can investigate what must have happened to get us between different equilibrium points.